If you haven't caught on, there's kind of a theme this morning about the presence of God. Throughout the scriptures, whenever we hear about the presence of God, when, whether it be in the garden and in creation, or on the mountain, on top of the mountain where Moses encounters God, or the tabernacle with God's people in the temple, we, we see this picture of fire and the might and the cloud and the smoke and the presence of God and the Israelites were terrified. The power of the presence of God. And in this series, we're talking about the church, a moving story and God and the church starting through the book of Acts and, and seeing how the church grew and developed and that the main character, if you want to put it that way, the main person in the whole book of Acts is not Peter, it is not Paul, it is the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit is doing through God's church and working through them. And last week we saw when Adam started us off and Jesus giving those final instructions. Um, you know, at that moment, he'd been spending some time here and there with Jesus being instructed and taught, and he gives them their final instructions and tells them to wait, to be patient, um, because the power, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you will be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the very ends of the earth. And Jesus gives them some instruction, and he gets carried up on a cloud into heaven, and the disciples are just, jaws just dropped open. Because they, they, I think they finally understand, oh my goodness, um, yeah, Jesus' throne is not in Jerusalem. He's been carried up into heaven, and his throne is in the very throne room of God. And he is at the right hand. He, this, I think they would have triggered Daniel chapter seven, the son of man who is carried up on a cloud. Guess how Jesus went? On a cloud. And I think his disciples were just filled with awe. And we know from the end of Luke and the beginning that the disciples, their response to God's marvelous works that they had just did through Jesus, his resurrection, and now Jesus' ascension. And I think sometimes we don't understand how important that ascension was for the disciples to see that and understand he was more than just a king. This is God. And their response to that was they worshiped him. They worshiped him. And then the angels, and they're sitting there on the mount. Who knows how long they would have stayed on the Mount of Olives Worshiping, and two angels show up and they go, <clears throat> why are you here? He goes, remember, he told you to go wait in Jerusalem. He will come back someday like you saw him leave. And so the disciples, okay. And so from that point, the disciples then go back to Jerusalem. We see later in chapter one that what they did was very important. They gathered together, they worshiped, they were filled with joy. They were filled with joy with what they experienced. And they go and they gather together and they spend their time praying together. This is what the disciples did. They worshiped together, they gathered, they were filled with joy and they prayed and they waited with anticipation for the promised Holy Spirit to come. And they waited. And they waited about a week at least, if we can calculate things correctly. I think my math is good. And for about a week, they gathered and they prayed and they waited with anticipation. This wasn't the next day that the Holy Spirit comes. And then we finally get to Acts chapter two and we get the Holy Spirit arrives. And one of the things that we Learn, I think, in these early steps of the disciples' reaction, even before the Holy Spirit comes, is really important because we start to see this pattern throughout the book of Acts develop where God's people gather together, they're worshiping, they're praying, and they're anticipating the Holy Spirit. And then, guess what? The Holy Spirit likes to move when that's happening. We see when God's people earnestly seek him 
and are faithful in the small things, the Holy Spirit likes to move in big ways. And we see this moving over and over in the church, not just in Jerusalem, but throughout the world. This is what God is doing. And so we're going to read. Let's read about this Acts chapter 2. We're going to read the first four verses, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. So Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, they being the disciples. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we're going to pause there. So they're gathered, maybe they very likely could have been in the, one of the upper chambers of the temple courts, but they were gathering together in prayer, early morning prayers. And all of a sudden, this booming, like tornado, rush of wind hits. Everybody in Jerusalem hears it, okay? Everybody hears it. And we're going to find out because people come rushing, thinking, what in the world is happening? What is going on? And in the midst of this, so fire comes down and it rests and comes and it's in this room where the church is gathering and it separates and it separates and rests on each and every disciple and believer in that room. And the spirit enables each and every one of them in this moment to be able to speak in languages they've never known. I mean, there's no reason for somebody from Galilee to be able to speak Coptic or, you know, from Egypt and Ethiopia or Persian from, you know, way far away, Mesopotamia and, and these things. But one of the things that Luke likes to do, whether it's in the Gospels or in the book of Acts, is he gives these words and phrases or images that are meant to kind of serve as a hyperlink. Do you all know what a hyperlink is? In an email, it's that blue text that's underlined, and when you click on that, magic happens. All of a sudden, boom, this website opens up, and it takes you there. And Luke does this with certain words and phrases and image throughout his writings. And what is meant when we read about wind and fire coming down and filling this house, filling this room, it's supposed to make us go, wait a minute, I've heard about this before. When have I heard about rushing wind and fire and, and this presence? And it's meant to take us back to the Old Testament. And I go, the spirit of the Lord, the wind, same word, hovered over the waters and he said, let there be light. And the burning bush and Moses meeting on the mountain and the tabernacle the presence of God filling the tabernacle in, in the temple in the days of Solomon. It's supposed to make us go, wait a minute. That's talking about the very presence and glory of God has come down and filled this room of people. And it's supposed to make us pause and go, whoa. Whoa. That is, hold, hold on, the presence and the power of God that the Israelites were scared to death to even come close. Even when Moses came down and his face was shining, they're like, you need to put something over your face. We can't look at that. And the powerful presence of God now is filling this place, and it's not about the place, it's about the people. And God's presence is with his people now. It used to be you had to go to a sacred space, whether it was the Garden of Eden or it was on top of this mountain or you had to go to this tabernacle or this temple or if you wanted to go worship God, if you want to encounter the presence of God, you had to go to that mountain or you had to go to that mountain. You remember what Jesus said to the woman at the well? A time is coming where you will neither worship on that mountain and you won't worship on that mountain, 
But true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. A time is coming where you don't have to go find the sacred spaces in this world. A time is coming where the people of God are those sacred spaces. The people of God, that is where heaven and earth meet. That's pretty cool. It's a huge leap in their understanding of the power and the presence and how close God has come to his people. There's no longer this line, this doorway, this curtain that you don't cross. But Jesus has made a way and he has sent his spirit for those who believe and those who come to him and who are baptized to receive the very power and presence of God. The church is now the temple of God, the church, us here. It's not about this building. It's about his people. And his presence lives within us. And that should make us tremble a little bit, understanding the gift, the honor, the responsibility. As important as the temple and the tabernacle is, that's who you are. It's his church. His presence comes and he fills us. The Holy Spirit is not just this little angel, this little conscience sitting on your shoulder, whispering what's right and wrong. It is the presence and the power of God that wants to direct you, that wants to guide you, that wants to lead you into abundant life. It wants to lead you and guide you and point you to Jesus, and it empowers us to become more like Jesus. That is the Holy Spirit. That is the presence. It's the same presence that caused the Israelites to tremble. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And he wants to move through you so that you can be his witness of his love, his goodness, and his grace to a world that needs it. He fills his people. Now here's the question. Understanding what the Holy Spirit truly is, do you want him? Do you want the Holy Spirit? Because it's the power and presence of God. Do we want to really let go of control and let God lead and guide us? Some people love the idea of the Holy Spirit because it makes them powerful, it makes them spectacular. You know, the gifts and these things. It's not about you, it's about God. And what God wants to do through you, you are welcomed into his kingdom. You are welcomed into the kingdom. Kingdom's for you, but it's not about you. It's about Jesus and his invitation to the whole world. Do you want him? Understand what it means when we follow and are called. And so the spirit comes and it has filled this place. And now the church is the place where heaven and earth meet these sacred spaces, and the Spirit empowers his people in this story in chapter two, the very beginning, empowers his people to speak in all these different languages. Let's continue reading and figure out why, because it's not that the Holy Spirit always empowers us to speak in tongues. I could speak French to you this morning, but I'm not going to. You know why? I don't think there's anybody in here, maybe there's somebody, I don't know, but you probably don't understand French very well. So why do we not just always speak in tongues? It's because there was a reason why God empowered them in this specific moment through his spirit. We're gonna read verse five through eight. We're gonna continue. Because now at that time, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound of the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? 
And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? And then he goes on to tell like where all these different people are coming from. And long story short, they're coming from North Africa all the way over by Libya. They're coming from modern day Iran and Iraq and even the edges of Afghanistan. They're coming from Saudi Arabia and Yemen from the south. They're coming from what's modern day Turkey and all around the corner, all the way over to Italy. And these people were devout Jews from all over the known world at that time. They're traveling hundreds and hundreds of miles for this pilgrimage during this holiday. And so these were devout Jews, devout Israelites. Who are these people? It's a really important question because in the Old Testament, we see that the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, had been scattered in the exiles amongst the nations And one of God's promises in the Old Testament is when the things change, when the new covenant comes, and when God's spirit starts to do something new and the Messiah comes, those 12 tribes, guess what, are going to be gathered back into a new kingdom. Do you remember the question that the disciples asked Jesus right before he ascended? He's like, is it now that you're going to give the kingdom back to Israel? And I think at that moment, he was like, okay, You don't quite get it yet, but that's okay. No, the time is not for you to know, but guess what? Now's the time that the kingdom of heaven is given back to Israel because all these people from all these nations are gathered and what are they hearing? They're hearing the good works, the mighty works of God, what God has been doing, each one in their own language. They've been living, their families have been living for 700 plus years, some of them, in other cultures. Ethnically and religiously, they were Jewish or they were Israelites, but culturally, they're from all over the place. They maybe knew Hebrew as a prayer language. They might have known some Greek as the trade language. But the message of the gospel, each one hears in their heart language what they spoke at home, what they spoke with their friends and their families. And God is gathering Israel back into his kingdom in this moment through his church. He's empowering his church to speak boldly in this moment. The spirit is moving through them. And then we read in verse 12 and 13, we read about their reaction, the people, because everybody in Jerusalem hears this, and it's like, man, something crazy just happened. And they gather, and they hear the speaking in tongues and the disciples, and and it's just weird. Let's just be honest, this is just weird. And here's their reaction. In verse 12 and 13, and all were amazed, all these foreigners, people from all over, all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they're just filled with new wine. Somebody got in a little bit early this morning, okay? And those are mostly the people who are from Jerusalem, Judea, because they're like, we don't know what they're saying. This is babbling to us. When the Spirit moves through his people, some people are going to react positively, And some people are going to react negatively. And as the church, we should be prepared for that. Just because you step into following God and you step into following the movement of the Spirit, some people are going to be like, that's awesome. What? Tell me more. And some people are going to be like, y'all are crazy. And that's going to be the reality that the church encounters. It's not always going to be everybody loves what the church does. But at this moment, Peter steps forward and he takes the opportunity to explain what is happening. And we give Peter's sermon. And this, you know, one of the best sermons that's ever been given in the world. Huge response. I love how he starts his sermon, though. You know it's going to be a good sermon when the preacher starts by saying this. We're not drunk It's only 9 a.m. Isn't that a great opening line? Okay. 
you got to remember, Peter is from like the hill country. He's a rough fisherman. And I, th- I love that Luke records this, that the first thing he says is, we're not drunk. It's only 9 a.m. You know, who knows what 9 p.m. might be like, but, you know, 9 a.m., we're not there. So, but Peter continues his message, and he is explaining what's going on. And his first point that he points out is that we're not drunk. This is the moment we all have been waiting for. For hundreds of years. God has promised, and he quotes the prophet Joel. And let's let's read what he says. This is the moment we've been waiting for. In verse 16. He says, and this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So Peter points out, he's like, look, this is what the prophets foretold. The time, the time of the gathering, the time of God coming and redoing all these things. This is what's happening. His Holy Spirit, his spirit is being poured out on his children. In verse 21, he says, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then Peter goes on to tell him, tell them who that Lord is. That Jesus is, is both Lord and Messiah. He points out and said, we all know, you've heard the stories of what Jesus did, the miracles, the signs and the wonders, all the things that Jesus did. But also, let us tell you, we were eyewitnesses and it was prophesied through David in the Psalms that the Messiah would be killed and he would be raised back to life. And not only would God raise him back to life, But he prophesied that he would go be at the right hand of God and that God raised Jesus a second time, which is the ascension. And he comes and he preaches. I mean, this is a kind of a summary of what he's saying. He points out, look, finally in verse 36, he kind of concludes and he says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made both Lord and Christ this Jesus whom you crucified. Jesus is Lord and Messiah, Lord and King over all things. And he clarifies for the crowd, for those who are responding, and many We're cut to the heart, verse 37 says. He says, what should we do? I mean, in a kind of way, they're like, shoot, we missed it. What do we do now? And Peter then gives them to invitation to life with Jesus. It's not too late. This is what he said in verse 38 and 39. said, and Peter said to them, repent, And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise, for this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. For all time. That includes you and me. They're not the only ones who get to receive the Holy Spirit. There is freedom. There is forgiveness that is offered to everybody through Jesus when you believe and repent, you turn from yourself, you turn to him as Lord and King and be baptized into him, dead to my sin, buried with Christ and raised to a new life. Be baptized in the name of Jesus and you too will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God in you his seal, and his mark on you. And you are invited. And you are invited to take part. 
And then we read in verses 40 through 42 that when the message is clear, the spirit moves and people respond and the kingdom grows. Let's read that. 40 through 42. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. So we see this pattern emerge throughout Scripture, throughout the book of Acts. If we live faithfully to the purpose and the calling of Jesus, and we're praying together, we're praying together, and we anticipate the Holy Spirit to do things in our lives, together, corporately, but even individually, the Holy Spirit to move. He likes to move. He wants to lead us and guide us, point us to Jesus, but help point others to Jesus so that they can encounter that. And when people respond, they get gathered into the gathering. They are brought into the family and they're taught about Jesus. They're taught what to do. They're encouraged to worship and we pray and the kingdom just keeps growing and the process just keeps going and then the spirit moves and there's this beautiful thing of how the kingdom grows. So we see this pattern God's people gather and pray. They seek him. The Holy Spirit moves. People respond, good and bad. And the kingdom grows. This beautiful picture. This is what it's meant to be. Now this morning, my question for you is, what is your response to God's marvelous works? What is your response to God's marvelous works, what he has done in the past, but also what God is doing today in the present in our lives, in the promise of what is to come in the future. What is your response? Are you living in a way that is anticipating? Maybe your response, maybe the first step for you is baptism. Maybe you've never been baptized. Maybe you've kind of been uh, somebody who's been observing on the outskirts and watching for a while, and you kind of believe, but you've not taken that step. That's the first step, to believe and say, I want this. I want, I want God. I want the presence of God in my life. I've messed it up enough, and I want him to lead and forgive and guide. Baptism, what it is and isn't, Baptism is not someday when I die, I'll be okay because I get to go to heaven. Baptism is today I am alive and the presence of God is with me forever. That is what baptism is. There is future hope, but it is about today and what God is doing in your life today. And if you've not taken that step we, we invite you, we hope you will. If you are a believer, if you're a follower and you said, I'm gonna take that step and I'm following, what's your reaction? Maybe for you, it's to rediscover the joy, to be filled with the joy of faith in Jesus and remembering the incredible gift that we have received and the importance of the gathering of worship, the importance of gathering in small groups and encouraging and celebrating what God is doing in and through us. Maybe for you, if you're really honest, your prayer life stinks. And you're not really praying, or it's maybe before a meal here and there. Part of the power and presence of God is because we pray. We stop and we remember and we pray and we pray individually, but we also gather and we pray together. We pray for one another. Maybe for you, it's I, I need to get back to praying. 
connecting to God. Maybe for you, it's I need to be faithful in the small things. The little, don't under, don't, overlooked the importance of the simple act that the disciples went to Jerusalem and they waited. They didn't try to start things on their own. They waited for God to move. What are the small things in your life, the small things you already know, God's will for you about loving your neighbor? What are those things that you need to step into that you've been neglecting? Being faithful in the small things. And finally, are you anticipating the Holy Spirit moving in and through you? The presence of God lives in you. Can you honestly tell me that God doesn't want to do something in and through you? Are you anticipating God doing something good? He wants to. Through you and his people, speaking and loving your neighbors, your family, your coworkers, whoever it might be. Anticipate, praying for one. God, give me one person I can show the love of Christ in word and deed. Whatever that looks like. Anticipate the Holy Spirit to do something. The church is a moving story. God, blessing us, and us being a blessing in this world and him moving through us. We are meant to be moving together towards Jesus. God and his spirit are moving through this church. I hope you feel it. I hope you see it. I know we do. We don't just expect, God is doing some things around here. Have you noticed some new faces around here? Right now, we're talking with five or six people who want to be baptized. God is moving through us right now. And you need to be a part of it, of the exciting things that God is doing. We invite you to step into it. And we want to see his kingdom grow here in Cicero in our region and to see people come to life with Jesus. Because that is the purpose and that is our calling, to see people set free. What is your next step? Where do you need to take that next step in following and being faithful? Spend some time today praying about that and thinking through and have that moment of courage to step into it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your goodness and your holiness. For your Holy Spirit that, gosh, sometimes, Father, we just, we act like your Holy Spirit doesn't even exist. And for that, we confess and we, we say sorry. Forgive us. The power and the presence that, that you have given us and have empowered us. Father, wait, may we be faithful to step into your leading. May we be not, take the blinders off and when we get in our own way, that you would move in us to know when we need to take a side and to, and to confess and move forward. We want to be your people who invite other people to Jesus the light, the city on a hill. Little temples, sacred spaces in our community where people can encounter the love and the power and the presence of Jesus. Would you do that through us? Would you do that in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our homes? And we say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we invite you to respond. We invite you to take a step. If you're with joining us at home, you can text the word respond to the number on the screen. You can do that here as well. That's okay. But if you have a very specific step that you want to take, 
We invite you to come forward. You can come meet me or, or Adam or find one of the pastors after the service. We would love to pray with you and talk with you about that. And so take that step. Let the Spirit move through you and get out of the way. And then we'll see what God can do through us. Let's stand and let's sing together.